it started as a dream. Exactly when is debatable. It could have been in 1956 when the University of South Florida was founded. Or some may say it was in 1960 when students first started attending classes at a campus that still had more sand than it had buildings. Really, it could be argued successfully that the dream started or continued with each passing decade since 1956. But the moment the dream turned to vision is not so much of an issue. And the moment that the dream turned vision became reality is a day that will forever be remembered as a defining moment in the University of South Florida history. On September 6, 1997, after spending four decades as spectators to the pageantry that is college football, the University of South Florida Bulls fielded a football team they could call their very own. When the green jersey Bulls, with gold helmets worn proudly, ran through the home tunnel of Tampa Stadium to the cheers of more than 49,000 frenzied fans, football at the nation's 13th largest university had finally arrived. The 40-year wait was over. It was time for the first stampede. September 6, 1997, a day that will live forever in the minds of USF fans, and perhaps a day that will live in infamy if you happen to play for the Kentucky Wesleyan Panthers. For college football historians and fans, it was the kind of evening that was meant for football. Beautiful blue skies against a fading sun with light winds that provided comfort to the mid-80s temperature. Well, all aspects of that day will uh, be something that all of us remember forever. Uh, before you entered the stadium, uh, signs on the streets, scalping tickets. You know, I know it's illegal, but it was exciting to have someone out there actually having a, a bounty on a ticket for USF football where we've never played a game before. Uh, our fans seem to be very experienced and poised fans in terms of their tailgating skills. It's almost like they've been practicing for years as well. Uh, everything about the, the day was electric. And what a debut it was. The USF captains, Ivan Alaka, Anthony Henry, Lance Hokey, and Demetrius Woods would proudly walk to midfield for the ceremonial coin toss. After first being out there, like warming up and everything, there was there wasn't many people in the stands. So, like I was kind of like adrenaline flowing and everything. And after we went back in the locker room, we talked amongst ourselves. And we went back out and on the the whole all the stands were real full. And when I looked around and heard all the people screaming, like chills went down my back. And it was, it'll be something that I'll never forget. It was a great feeling. The uh, the moment we walked out and the stadium wasn't completely filled um, during pregame but the student section was packed. And there was just a roar from that student section alone that was deafening, and uh, I couldn't do anything but smile. Heads, he calls it. It is heads. Kentucky Wesleyan has won the toss. They are going to defer to the second half. Which goal do you want to kick, receive, or defend the goal? We want to take the ball. We want the ball. South Florida will be receiving. Just seconds after 7.07 that evening, the Panthers' Adam Kilgore kicked a northbound ball to Charlie Jackson. Scary. All you can think about is the ball is coming down. It's like, oh, man, I got to catch this. Jackson appropriately wore the number one on his jersey as he became the proud carrier of USF's first football. The southbound Jackson, who took custody of the ball at the two-yard line, would be brought down 32 yards later. The Bulls would commence an historic first drive on a first and 10 from their own 34-yard line. Questions regarding what kind of composure could be expected from a first-year program had been whispered from the Bulls' first practice a year earlier. But the year-long questioning was answered in a mistake-free matter of 3 minutes and 16 seconds of game time. It would start with quarterback Chad Barnhart's lateral to Jackson for 10 yards and USF's first first down. Tailback Raphael Williams rushed right for 15 more yards and another first down. After Jackson missed Barnhart's first pass attempt, Williams ran up the middle for four yards. Split end Cliff Dell would then become the recipient of Barnhart's first pass completion 16 yards downfield. 
A Williams run for one yard and an incomplete pass to Dell finally had the Bulls on their heels with a third and nine. But Barnhart calmly tossed the ball to tight end Trevor Hippolyte for a 32-yard gain to Kentucky Wesleyan's three-yard line and USF's first ever knock at the touchdown door. A play later, USF was ready to kick the door down. Yeah, I think it was um, ISO, ISO 23. And, um, all I know, I got the handoff and, and nothing was going to stop me from getting in because I think I had got stopped the previous play. And, um, I wasn't going to be denied that time. Steve Riggs would add an extra point kick, and USF football had its first lead, 7 to nothing, with just over three minutes into the game. Not to be outdone, the USF defense in its first ever stand held Kentucky Wesley into four yards on three plays, forcing a punt. What would ensue would be a lesson on how many ways a football team could score points. Runs. Catches. Interception returns. Field goals. The Bulls would uncover all of them. Eight different USF players scored points, and it didn't stop until the home side of the scoreboard read 80, and across the board, to the three. But it was fun, and it was amazing that the game went off like it did. I mean, I didn't know, I didn't expect us to win like we did. I didn't expect it to go off as well as it did. It was a very emotional moment for all of us. I know that uh, uh, just watching them come out was a tremendous feeling, and uh, it was special. I was just pumped up. Um, I had goosebumps running up and down my um, up, up and down my back, and uh, I was ready to play. It was unbelievable. I, I don't know how to explain it. Um, you know, it was like Christmas, it was better than Christmas, you know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was, like Coach Levitt said, unbelievable. It was the, um, one of the most unbelievable experiences that I ever felt. I mean, running out there, and you have the fireworks, and you have the crowd, and you have the bands. I mean, it's like an unbelievable feeling. The celebration even allowed USF coaches to sip from a fountain of youth. First game, uh, the game's over. We come down the field, about a minute, 30 seconds left to go in the game. And the clock goes off, and we look up, and it's 80 to 3, and the fans are in the total frenzy. The next thing I know, I'm running around the field with this towel in my hand, this Gatorade towel, whooping and hollering and slapping fives with all the people. And I went, wait a minute, I'm a coach, not a player. <laughs> that will stand out more than anything in, I think ever. You know, it's, it's, that was unbelievable. I, I, I had to stop myself and take it all in and realize, Mike, you're a coach, you're not supposed to act like this. You know, you're supposed to be a little more, you know, calm and, and just enjoy the moment. But it, that, to me, will go down in history as one of my most memorable times ever, whether the player and the coach, that, uh, that feeling there of watching the smiles on the faces of those kids. What happened on September 6, 1997, was anything but a game plan that was scratched in the middle of a huddle in the dirt. It was the result of what was arguably the most well thought out plans ever formulated in initiating a college football program. The enthusiasm and excitement for college football in Tampa, Florida is very, very special. It's like probably no other place in America. You cannot replicate what's occurred here in Tampa someplace else. This cannot be a model per se, an exact replica in some other part of the country because I don't think that the conditions exist elsewhere. And the people demonstrated that on September 6th and have continued to demonstrate that throughout the year. And uh, the unique qualities of this program certainly came to a focus on that very, very special night with great weather, great crowd, great conditions, great game, great excitement, great enthusiasm, and a very, very special uh, day in the history of this university. In the end, while the USF plan made defy replication, it led to record levels of support, including nearly 22,000 season tickets, shattering the NCAA 1AA record. While grassroots efforts to start football at the University of South Florida came and went with each passing decade since 1956, all of those proved firmly in the realm of dreams. But in 1991, then University President Dr. Francis Borkowski and Athletic Director Paul Griffin turned those dreams into a vision. 
Their mission directed the USF community to discuss and debate the football issue to the point that it would move forward or end forevermore. In July 1993, Griffin, wanting to establish an immediate and credible identity to what would become USF football, pulled off a coup when he announced the addition of Leroy Selman, the most respected athlete in Tampa Bay's sports history. Selman's responsibilities included a leadership role in securing a $5 million endowment to fund a football program. Our program at that time was a vision. And it's very hard for people to uh, become attached to merely a vision. And so we needed to have an icon relative to our football program. And we knew it was going to be several years before we had a coach and a player and a team and a schedule and all those kind of things. And uh, you couldn't draw up a better figure that you wanted to represent and model what your college program was going to be about uh, better than Leroy because he represented excellence on the field and excellence in terms of his personal character and excellence in terms of the respect that he garnered, contributed, and attracted to our program. So during that growth pattern, he was USF football. Selman, one of only two people, along with Merlin Olson, to claim membership in both the Pro Football Hall of Fame and the GTE Academic All-America Hall of Fame, gave the Bulls instant credibility. By December 1993, USF had hired a new president, Betty Castor, who would become a strong proponent of the addition of football and the key advocate in front of the State Board of Regents. The crucial meeting came in Orlando on September 15, 1995. It was on that day final approval finally came and USF had its answer once and for all, there would be football. Griffin wasted little time celebrating. One day later, on September 16, 1995, he began his search for the ideal coach for the unique opportunity at USF. It sounds silly, but there's only going to be one first coach. It will never happen again. It will always be Jim Levin will be the first coach for USF football. It was very critical for us to have some important personal characteristics and professional characteristics. Unlike an established program, uh, we had to go and sell our program. We had to sell it to players, high school coaches, uh, ticket holders, contributors, a whole wide range of constituencies. So we had to have someone that understood the vision, embraced the vision, and was able to quickly communicate that to others effectively. On December 3, 1995, President Castor and Griffin introduced Florida Rays' Jim Levitt as the first coach in University of South Florida football history. It's great to be here. It is great to be here. You just don't know how great it is to be here. Uh, it was, it was, <laughs> it was a, a very uh, emotional moment for me because I really knew that I was going to be a part of something very special and that I was going to have the opportunity to uh, recruit in my home state, uh, to come back home where I, I have so many friends. Uh, the memories of growing up here uh, are, um, are very special to me. And to know that I was going to be a part of that was, was quite overwhelming. I, um, I can't begin to even, <laughs> even tell you how overwhelming it was. And, and then when I came down here and I walked into our, our trailer, it had no walls and no conference table, no boards, no anything. And, uh, and Leroy and Paul uh, look at me, and Paul turns to me and says, uh, Jim, start football. <laughs> Just as Griffin hadn't wasted time in starting his search for Levitt, Levitt began immediate preparations for building a staff and recruiting players. By the time fall classes rolled around the following September, Levitt and his staff had fielded nearly 80 players who wanted to share in the opportunity to go where no man had gone before, into a USF football uniform and an ensuing season of practice leading up to the first ever USF football game. Levitt and staff looked for and found character in the pioneer players. So I lived in Project Housing all my life, and I really didn't want to stay there anymore, and I didn't want my grandmother so the inspiration I get is every time I go home to see the negativity that's around the neighborhood and then to look at my grandmother and try to pull her up out of that. I love my grandmother to death, my mother. They support me very much even though they can't make it to all the game, home games. They call and they support me a lot. 
Practices began on September 6, 1996 and led up to three intra-squad scrimmages. The first came on September 25, 1996, before some 5,000 fans at the USF Soccer Stadium. And the beginning couldn't have been any more exciting with quarterback Lance Hokey throwing a 70-yard touchdown pass to Charlie Jackson. That week of practice, Coach Canales said, look, we're going to get a good turnout at, at this uh, scrimmage and we're going to light them up. First play, we're going to run a play we call Reno, which is uh, they've been seeing a screen pass all week. And uh, we faked the screen. And Charlie, instead of blocking, fakes the block and then releases down the field. And um, it's funny, as I was making the pump fake, uh, one of the D linemen had gotten through. I had to avoid him. Luckily, I got the ball off quick enough, and uh, yeah. Charlie made the play. And as the ball was in the air, I just was like, oh, man, I got to catch this. And it was, it was special. It was a special moment. There would be attrition throughout the fall and the following session of spring practices, but clearly an identity and bond was being formed amongst the players who would become the pioneers of USF football. Uh, we're, we're like brothers. It's, our defense was a very uh, tight unit. We spent a lot of time over the summer together in preparation for the season. We all stayed in the same apartment, basically. We just had a great time, so the love and the bond is really there. Most of all of us been from Florida. We know that everyone in Florida are good ball players. So we know we know how to act with each other because we're at the same age and stuff. So we know how to relate to each other. With the tone, character, and identity established, the Bulls began final preparations when they reported back in August for practice leading up to the September 6th debut. Following the smashing debut against Kentucky Wesley. The Bulls would take their first road trip to play at the Citadel, a 1AA program that enjoys a rich football tradition. Unlike the opening game, this one would turn into a defensive war that would test the young Bulls' resiliency and character. The first quarter would see the two teams exchange a series of five punts before the Bulls earned the first break with Marshall Smith's fumble recovery on USF's 39-yard line. The Bulls appeared ready to capitalize, marching to Citadel's 32-yard line on three Chad Barnhart passes, two of those to tight end Trevor Hippolyte. With a fourth and two at the 32, the Bulls chose to seek the first down, and another pass attempt to Hippolyte fell incomplete. It was now three minutes into the second quarter, and the teams were still scoreless. But Citadel would then make a first strike. In a 12-play drive, the Bulldogs would choose to run 11 times with just one pass of 16 yards mixed in. Citadel took a 7-0 lead that would last until halftime. The Bulls' Steve Riggs would kick off to open the second half, and Citadel's Carlos Franks, the nation's leading return specialist heading into the game, took off for 42 yards, putting momentum in the Bulldogs' corner. But three running plays would net just two yards, and the Bulls' defense signaled it had no quit. The Citadel punt would pin the Bulls back at their own three-yard line, squarely challenging the character of this game-and-a-half-old program, a test that would be answered in resounding fashion by the arm of Chad Barnhart. After a Raphael Williams run of two yards gave quarterback Barnhart some breathing room, he would toss a series of completions to Cliff Dell, Williams, and Hippolyte, including this 26-yard play. Just as Citadel had made a running march on the end zone in the first half, the Bulls put Barnhart's arm on display in a march of their own that would see 10 pass completions among 16 plays in what would stand as USF's longest touchdown drive of the season, 97 yards. Chad throws the hard ball. He, he's always slinging it probably as hard as he can, as far as he can. So, I mean, um, he's a real good guy. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, if you miss a ball or something, he'll give you that look, that quarterback look that quarterbacks usually give receivers. You know, after you miss a pass or something, he'll give you that look. And, you know, next time he throws it, you better go ahead and catch it. 16 plays and 8 minutes and 4 seconds after the drive commenced, Barnhart found Marcus Rivers for a 12-yard completion and a game-tying touchdown. The remainder of the third quarter and the first four series of the fourth quarter would go by without a first down from either team as the defenses reasserted their intention to control the game's outcome. By now, only 9-12 remained and the score was standing in time at 7-7. The Bulls, now with possession and needing only a field goal and maybe one more defensive stand, began to manage the clock with the running game. Tailback Jermaine Clemens gained 23 yards on four successive runs, and the Bulls were now within one yard of midfield. But just as quickly, two incomplete passes sandwiched around a five-yard procedure penalty forced a USF punt. 
With five minutes remaining and attention focused on Frank and his nation-leading return stats, the Bulls effectively stifled him and Citadel found themselves at the 24-yard line in front of a USF defense that had already forced seven punts. With only one pass completion to his credit, Citadel quarterback Stanley Myers hardly seemed a threat to turn the game with his arm, but that's exactly what he did. This 20-yard strike to Derek Green, combined with a late hit penalty, put the Bulldogs at the USF 41-yard line. After a brief return to the run, one carry for four yards, Myers found Green again, this time for 13 yards, and Citadel was now in field goal position. Good snap, good placement. Although USF would have an opportunity to showcase its two-minute offense, the game would end on a second down interception. Even with the loss, USF learned it could stand block to block with a tradition-rich 1AA program, but the learning would need to continue with even bigger battles ahead. On September 20th, the Bulls found themselves in their second straight Bulldog fight, this time at home against the Drake Bulldogs, another program with solid tradition. Gaining possession at their own 48-yard line with 4.03 remaining in the opening quarter, Drake runner Jason Grove gained 11 yards, setting up a play-action pass from quarterback Solon Bell to Jeff Boyer, covering the final 41 yards to a touchdown and a 7-0 lead. USF responded quickly in reverse fashion to Drake's apparent strategy to set the pass up with its running game. USF would take possession at their own 25 and effectively move downfield with five completions from Chad Barnhart. Now at Drake's 32-yard line, the Bulls were ready to sneak in a run for Jermaine Clemens. He's got a touchdown, South Florida. USF would miss the extra point, but go on to score nine more points in the second quarter, including a 42-yard fumble return by free safety Anthony Henry and a Steve Riggs field goal, giving the Bulls a 15-10 halftime lead. The second half would begin with the exchange of four punts before South Florida mounted the first serious drive. The Bulls took possession with 8.15 to play in the third quarter on their own 45-yard line. After a Marcus Rivers catch and three Jermaine Clemens runs moved the ball to the Drake 38-yard line, Chad Barnhart took to the air. Following a six-yard completion to Corey Porter, USF stood at the 32-yard line but faced a fourth and two. The Bulls decided to go. With a 22-10 lead, the Bulls seemingly captured the momentum they were after, and they looked to the defense to dig in. The defense would have to meet that challenge, especially after USF allowed a 47-yard kick return to the USF 45-yard line. The defense appeared to dig in, though, sacking Drake's Solon Bell on the very next play. But Drake would all but abandon the pass, and they cut into the Bulls' 12-point lead with a seven-play drive that ended with a seven-yard TD run from Jason Grove. Touchdown. Following a USF punt, and now into the fourth quarter, Drake appeared content to remain with a ground attack, gaining 19 yards in two plays. Perhaps looking for more of the same, the USF defense was caught off guard when Solon Bell hit Jeff Boyer for a 44-yard pass to USF's 18-yard line. Five runs later, Drake would reach the two-yard line. With just under nine minutes remaining and down by six, on fourth and goal, the Bulldogs went for the touchdown. Fights his way to the goal line. With the extra point, Drake had erased USF's 22-10 lead. But still, USF had time, so much so that the Bulls even punted following their next possession with 5.25 remaining. And the plan appeared to work. After Drake gained but one yard on its first carry, the USF defense realized the outcome of this game was now in their collective hands. Boyer in motion. The fullback. Fumble! And the Bulls say they have the football. Let's see what the official says. And he says the Bulls have the football. With the ball placed just 35 yards from the goal line and a winning score, and over four minutes remaining, the crowd of more than 33,000 could sense a dramatic Bulls win. The confidence grew with Jermaine Clemens' eight-yard run to the 27. Even after a false start penalty on the next play cost the Bulls five yards, the confidence remained. But after two incomplete passes, confidence was suddenly met with the reality that it was either a 49-yard field goal attempt or a shot at fourth and seven. Coach Jim Lovett placed his confidence in the leg of kicker Steve Riggs. Yard attempt.
just short. Even with the miss, Levitt remained confident in his team. He knew it was a missed opportunity, and he also knew there is much more to the first ever season and beyond than one game or one play. Uh, we definitely have talent here. It is, that's not a problem. But to, uh, to get the kind of leadership and to get the kind of experience that we need to win football games is very difficult. Uh, I was most concerned about our guys playing hard, practicing hard, playing hard, and trying to establish that. Because if you don't establish that, you're never going to win uh, many games ever. And that, that was uh, end up being um, a strong part of this program. There would be more and even bigger challenges this season for the still young Bulls. And the biggest to date was just one week away as USF faced the nation's number three one double A team, Western Kentucky. Facing a brilliant hilltopper offense led by quarterback Willie Taggart, the Bulls picked up where they had left off during their first road game, on defense. USF wasn't fooled when Taggart, a dangerous runner, opted to pass on his very first play. I was playing man, and everybody else had their own position uh, with no safety help. And so basically, we played it where I played uh, just about eight yards off the receiver and just played him wherever he went. And it was the first play, and I seen him drop back like an option, and he stepped back in the pocket. And I think the dude, Joy Stockton, uh, he went on the post route, and I was on his upfield shoulder, and the ball was kind of overthrown. So I just went up underneath him and just landed in my hands. Chad Barnhart and company would seize the opportunity provided by Davis's interception. Barnhart would complete six passes to six different receivers, moving the Bulls to the Western Kentucky four-yard line before being faced with a fourth down. Still early in the game, the Bulls chose to get points on the board, and Steve Riggs obliged with a 21-yard field goal for a 3 to nothing lead. The Hilltoppers would respond with an 80-yard drive for a touchdown and a 7-3 lead just over a minute into the second quarter. But the Bulls remained poised and were able to stop Western Kentucky on its next two possessions. With just over four minutes remaining in the half and the teams locked in an apparent battle for field position, USF faced a fourth and less than an inch on their own 41-yard line. Seeking any edge to be had and a possible march to the lead at the half, the Bulls would gamble. The gamble would fail and Western Kentucky would capitalize with a seven play drive for a touchdown and a 14 to three lead. Still, the Bulls had confidence in trailing by just 11 points to the nation's number three team. USF would be forced to punt on its next possession, allowing the Hilltoppers one final opportunity before the half. Thinking run, the USF defense was caught by a 40 yard scoring strike from Taggart to Jade Gummer on the very first play turning a defensive battle into a 21-3 halftime lead for Western Kentucky. Conceding nothing, USF's defense returned to open the second half with a three and out stand. Trailing 21-3, the Bulls would seek an immediate offensive strike, and they appeared to get it when return man Charlie Jackson fielded the next punt and found a sideline. Far across the field came a yellow flag that signaled a USF penalty and more importantly, a symbolic end to any momentum that USF had regained. I really don't get mad at the guys because they're busting their butts 100% and that's all you can ask for. If they make a mistake down the line, hey, got to live with it. The nation's number three team would go on to win 31 to three, but USF's players left that game with a taste of what this program can be and the work it will take to get that's, there. That's our goal, just to stay after in the weight room, punish, you know, punish our bodies in the weight room. The more you sweat and practice, the less you bleed in battle. So that's one of our goals. The work would need to get done in a hurry, especially with Moorhead State, the nation's number one offense with more than 500 yards per game, arriving in Tampa Stadium for game five. It was easy to see why the Eagles had the number one offense when they took the opening kickoff and marched 65 yards in 11 plays for a 7 to nothing lead just 4 minutes and 29 seconds into the game. But if it was Moorhead State who impressed to open the first quarter, it was USF who would close that quarter with offensive firepower of its own. The Bulls would close the opening quarter marching 80 yards in 13 plays, mixing runs, passes, and even a reverse. It ended five minutes and 12 seconds after it started with a one-yard run from Raphael Williams. USF would manage two Steve Riggs field goals in the second quarter while slowing the dangerous Moorhead offense to just 20 net yards after the opening touchdown drive. 
Moorhead State would appear to recapture its game opening form in the first second half possession when the Eagles drove 64 yards to the Bulls' five yard line and threatened to take the lead. But the USF defense held and the 74 yards netted only a field goal, allowing the Bulls to maintain a 13 to 10 edge. USF answered Moorhead's mounting pressure with an 11 yard scoring strike from Chad Barnhart to Darren Bishop, stretching the USF lead to 20 to 10. Sensing the Eagle wings had been clipped, the USF defense held for a three and out. Marcus Rivers blocked the Todd Dinkle putt, and Demetrius Woods returned the ball to the Moorhead State 11-yard line. Try as they might to turn the ball back to Moorhead State with a 15-yard penalty and a fumble into the end zone, USF stayed the course. Tailback Raphael Williams would carry twice for 16 yards to the four-yard line, where he fumbled into the end zone, only to have teammate Otis Dixon comfortably secure the ball for a touchdown and a 27-10 lead. The Bulls would allow one more Moorhead touchdown, but the defense was to be credited with an outstanding performance, limiting an offense accustomed to 500 yards a game to 355, while the Bulls offense would gain 392, including 222 on the ground. Following a loss at Elon the next week that included a season-ending leg fracture to wide receiver Marcus Rivers, the Bulls returned home once again for the program's first ever homecoming game. This one against Southern Illinois, one of two former national championship teams on USF's inaugural season schedule, along with four-time champion Georgia Southern. Just as Western Kentucky, the Citadel, and Moorhead State had provided benchmark games to gauge USF's first-year progress against tradition-rich teams, so too would the Southern Illinois game. Although the Bulls managed just three points in the first three quarters, progress was clearly evident for the Bulls, who took this game into the fourth quarter and closed to 13-10 when Jermaine Clemens scored on a seven-yard run with 12 minutes remaining. The game was literally waiting to be grabbed, and the USF defense made a strong move in that direction, holding the Salukis on downs to hand the ball back over to the USF offense. But on first down, and again on the next USF possession, SIU defenders would come up with big interceptions to secure a hard-fought 23-10 win. The Southern Illinois game took USF into a bye week, allowing for Coach Levitt and staff an opportunity to assess the seven-week start to USF's historical first season. It's an offense that demands a lot on the quarterback, and as the quarterback goes, so goes the team. And uh, with Chad Barnhart, uh, his development I think became very apparent in Charlton Southern, although we didn't score a lot of points, we moved the ball up and down the field, and you could start to see the transformation from uh, Chad developing through the beginning of the year and as he progressed and, and as he began to take over the team and realizing he was the leader and he could demand more and he could do different things. And just watching him develop, and, and it was at Charlton Southern game when I told myself, I think we're, I think we're there. Re-energized, the Bulls set out on the final four-week span of the first stampede, looking forward to three home games in that period, including a contest with four-time national champion Georgia Southern. The stretch would begin on the first day of November, when the Charleston Southern Buccaneers would come looking to loot and plunder the Bulls at Tampa Stadium. USF would stand for none of that. After allowing an early field goal and trailing three to nothing, USF's Charlie Jackson would spend all of 17 seconds to set some USF history with the program's first ever kick return for a touchdown. And the kickoff came to me gratefully and uh, Jermaine led me up the gut and everything went from there and it was a foot race. Pretty long, <laughs> pretty long foot race at that, 97 yards, and out of breath I had to go pump some oxygen. But it, it was great, the crowd, the fans, you couldn't ask for anything more. Any wind in the Buccaneers' sails was left at sea and the Bulls would go on to score 10 more unanswered points on a Jermaine Clemens touchdown run and a Steve Riggs field goal all in the first half. Charleston Southern would manage one more field goal, but USF safety Roy Manns would push the Bucks off any plank remaining to support them with a 39-yard interception return for a touchdown, his fourth interception on the season and second for a score. 
With the 24-6 win, USF looked forward to one final road trip that would begin the final three weeks of the inaugural season. What time is it? Full time! The November 8th game at Cumberland, a traditionally powerful NAIA program, brought some apprehension to Coach Levitt, primarily since it was a team difficult to assess with the schedule it had played. But Levitt knew as soon as he saw the Cumberland players on the field during pregame that his Bulls would face a load of athletes and a team that would try to run, run, and run some more. They had probably 45 to 50 full scholarship players. They had some players from Tennessee that had transferred in some players from Mississippi State that transferred in, some players from a number of Division I schools that transferred in. And when we went on that field at Cumberland University and looked at the size and the athleticism of that football team, I, I really didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know what our, how our chances would be uh, to beat them. And I told our guys in the locker room, I said, you know, it's, uh, our talent is good, but their talent is good as well. And it's going to take the toughest team uh, the toughest, mentally, uh, the mentally toughest team was going to win that game. The lesson wasn't wasted on the USF defense. The Bulls didn't need email to let Cumberland know its intentions. Their actions were enough as they stuffed Cumberland's first three runs for a total of two yards and their first six carries netted just 11 yards. Although the Bulls could not effectively move the ball on their first two possessions, the offense was eventually able to respond to the defense's lead. After defensive tackle Theremin Edwards recovered a fumble at the Cumberland 34-yard line. Raphael Williams netted 19 yards on three successive runs, and after a nine-yard Chad Barnhart pass to Charlie Jackson, the ball went back into Williams' hands for the final six yards and a 7-0 USF lead with just 1.51 remaining in the first quarter. Two series later, Cumberland would fumble again, but this time the USF offense would not even bother with returning to the field, as linebacker Demetrius Woods would scoop up the loose ball and rumble 24 yards for a 14-0 USF lead. Cumberland would manage 14 yards of offense on its next possession, but they only led to yet another punt, and Barnhart made quick work of another USF drive, completing back-to-back -back passes to Jermaine Clemens and Raphael Williams for 33 and 49 yards and an ever-increasing 20 to nothing lead. With Cumberland remaining intent on finding its running game, USF's defense was able to constantly hand the ball back to its offense and would finish the game holding the Bulldogs to 133 rushing yards on 50 carries and zero passing yards. The defense constantly gave the offense outstanding field position, leading to a 44 to nothing blowout win for USF. When people will just fear South Florida. When they think about playing South Florida, then you know, their hearts will stop and their palms will start sweating. And They'll just get scared, so that's our goal next year. While USF was not entirely certain what to expect from Cumberland, there was no guessing what its next opponent, Georgia Southern, was all about. NCAA Division I AA supremacy with four national championships and a number eight national ranking heading into their November 15th date with the Bulls. It was a real challenge for the whole team because we're all young and I mean, we're really, really hyped to go out there. One thing was clear. Despite being just eight games old, the USF players would not be intimidated by the history-rich Eagles. Even after Georgia Southern quarterback Greg Hill took the game's third snap, ran for 77 yards, and didn't stop until the Eagles had a 7-0 lead just one minute and 25 seconds into the game. The run was but a blip on the USF defense's radar screen, and while the Bulls' offense was managing three first-half field goals from Steve Riggs, the defense held the Eagles to but three additional first-half points that saw the Bulls trail by a 10-9 margin at halftime. The two defenses would dominate in the third quarter, although the Eagles were able to manage one touchdown drive of 64 yards to enter the fourth quarter with a 17-9 lead. If Georgia Southern was signaling any whispers of their mystique, the Bulls weren't willing to listen. Quarterback Chad Barnhart displaying brilliant maturity in just his eighth career start would assume commanding presence in USF's opening fourth quarter drive. It takes some time. Um, really the only, the only situation that really helps a lot is, is playing in games. And, and you can look at your playbook and that, you know, you've got to do that. But 
until you get out and you're scrimmaging like we did in spring and, and you're practicing and then you're playing in games, that's when you really start to pick it up a lot. And I think we all have as this year has gone on. With a first down and renewed vigor, USF kept the ball on the ground for seven consecutive plays, netting 32 yards before Barnhart would find tight end Trevor Hippolyte for a nine-yard scoring pass that took the Bulls to within 17 to 15 with the nation's number eight team. The extra point decision was an easy one. The Bulls would go for two and the tie. You know, we've been working on that for a year and a half now, since we first got here. And I said, you know, you come somebody mentioned to me that Jermaine was a quarterback. And I said, oh, good, this is good, you know. And I always go back to this, and it's really funny. When I was playing against Steve Young, and, and uh, they ran that play against Missouri in the Holiday Bowl to win the game. And I always kept that in my book and realized, you know, we're going to use that play, you're going to use that play. One of these times when the time's right, we're going to use that play. And it's funny you said it was very memorable, because it is. It's, uh, it was the right situation, the right time, the right place. Hippolyte in motion. The pitch. This may be a pass. Back the opposite way. Barnhart for the two-point oh. conversion. And we're tied at 17. I was, I was telling myself I was going to kick myself if I dropped it. But, uh, you know, I'm glad I, I'm glad I, I'm really glad I caught that ball. I've never heard the end of it. Like nationally prominent teams are prone to do, Georgia Southern responded with an eight-play, 70-yard drive of its own to go back up 24 to 17 before kicking the ball back to the Bulls with 7:32 remaining in the game. But again, Barnhart would lead an offense that had no quit. Three Jermaine Clemens runs netted one first down. A 16-yard third down Barnhart pass to Charlie Jackson brought yet another. After a Raphael Williams run was stopped for no gain, Barnhart went over the top to Darren Bishop for 33 yards to the Georgia Southern four-yard line. I knew that we wanted to go for two. I knew that that was the right decision. I knew that we needed to try to, to get the win at that point of the game. We had a lot of momentum going for us right then. We had gotten the two-point conversion. The previous touchdown, uh, Georgia Southern had been in an overtime game already and had won that game. We had never been in a situation like that. And in the red zone, certainly their offense was very strong in that area of the field. So I knew that we were going to go for two, but I didn't know when to share that with, uh, with Mike Canales. After two Williams runs left the ball at the one, USF stood those simple few inches away from tying or even leading the number eight team in the country with under two minutes remaining in the game. With Levitt's decision already made on the two-point attempt, USF would go for what surely would be the program's biggest win to date. Barnhart under pressure, cannot get away. Georgia Southern dodges a bullet. Unwilling to claim moral victories, a sure sign that losing would be acceptable, Levitt and his team vowed to forge ahead to the days when games like this would be won by the Bulls on the field of play. It's an impression from our head coach, too. I mean, he's a perfectionist, and he wants only the best. And so it's hard to be satisfied with a below 500 season, you know, even though it was the first year. So we always, you know, are, are going to strive to be better and set our sights uh, at the very top. Putting the Georgia Southern game behind, the Bulls had one final date remaining in their inaugural season. And the season finale with Davidson would prove every bit as momentous and exciting as the 80-3 win over Kentucky Wesleyan 11 weeks earlier. Although USF is a first-year program, the night would begin with the introduction of two senior transfers, kicker Steve Riggs and tight end Brian Erb, who would play their final college game. While USF would not strike as quickly as it did in that first game, the Bulls did strike effectively and often, while allowing for all of its eligible players to see action. And although the pass fell incomplete, Chad Barnhart's play action bomb to Corey Porter on the game's first play signaled USF's game plan for the night. After the USF defense allowed the only three points it would give up all night on a Davidson field goal six minutes into the game, the game effectively became a Bulls offensive highlight reel. While Chad Barnhart and Lance Hokey split halves at quarterback, their results were equally impressive and effective, and six different Bulls would score touchdowns. 
The scoring fest got underway some 10 minutes into the first quarter when Raphael Williams ran for the final 26 yards of a three-play 65-yard drive that included a 39-yard pass to Cliff Dell. After a three-and-out stand by the USF defense, Barnhart and company closed the first quarter with a second straight quick strike, scoring on a four-play 68-yard drive that culminated with a 56-yard pass from Barnhart to Charlie Jackson, marking the longest scoring strike of the USF season. Another three and out for Davidson gave Barnhart yet another opportunity for a quick strike as he led the offense with passes of 19, 15, and 20 yards and route to a six-play 45-yard drive, including Williams' second touchdown run of the night, this time from five yards out. And before the half could end, USF got in another quick drive, leading up to a Jermaine Clemens two-yard touchdown run and a 28-3 lead at the half. With 211 yards on 14 of 22 passing, Chad Barnhart gave way to Lance Hokey in the second half, and Hokey was not to be outdone. After two Williams runs advanced the ball seven yards to the south side of the 50-yard line, Hokey and company were looking at a third and three. Hokey to the air for the first time tonight. Lays it out there. He's got Bishop. The Bishop got downfield. Hokey on the celebration. When I asked Coach Canales, I said, look, give me something safe, something sound that I can just get my feet wet, you know, and kind of get into a rhythm. Well, he gave me that play, um, which really, Darren is the, the last option. Uh, and there's a series of other safe passes to go to, but what had happened was it was third down, and, and they were blitzing. And they brought up uh, both outside linebackers, which left Darren all alone, one-on-one, -on -one, with a corner. And uh, I just figured, hey, I'll put it up. and see what happens. He, uh, he made the play and uh, scored six points. Hokey would give way to Glenn Gant and Brian Fraze at quarterback in the final minutes, but not until he had completed seven of nine passes for 77 yards and two touchdowns. And while the Bulls offense would add 48 points to their inaugural season total, the defense limited Davidson to 111 total yards, 51 of which came on the opening game drive that led to the only three points and just five first downs. With the explosive close to the Bulls' historical first season, smiles were the rage. Smiles for what had happened all season. Smiles for the closing 48-3 win, but especially smiles of unabashed anticipation for where the pioneer players and coaches for USF football know they are taking the program. It is the future, both immediate and long-term, that these players and coaches now look forward to. I know the kids are real proud. They did a great job, them and, and the staff. And, and I know Coach Levitt was real proud of what the kids uh, were able to do. I mean, that's, uh, for as many young kids as we had, it was just an effort. Yes, yeah, so we just have to work harder and continue to strive to be the best that we can be. We really want to open the offense up. We really haven't put everything into it. Um, our base, our running game is probably there where we like it to be. There's some areas we definitely need to work on and get better at. We're looking to take it, you know, straight to the playoffs next year. We're looking to come out with a ring also. We'll be looking for a ring, you know. I mean, that, that's, that's what's on our mind. You know, we know what we want. We want a national championship. And, uh, you know, we really think we can do it. You know, work hard and uh, improve, improve every week. You know, we got to make sure we're proving. And that, you know, why would we want to, you know, go for anything else? With five impressive victories from an inaugural season team that returns every player except the starting kicker and a backup tight end, and with a solid fan base of nearly 22,000 season ticket holders and an average attendance above 30,000, there is every reason to be optimistic regarding the future of USF football. Throw in the prospect of a brand new $7 million training complex and a $200 million state-of-the-art NFL stadium that will be home to future Bulls games, and the future star shines even brighter. We're in the state of Florida, which is the most powerful football state in America. I mean, I don't think there's any question about that. We're in an area that has uh, the best talent uh, uh, in the country. I really believe that, the best high school talent in the country. Expectations in the state are high. And that goes uh, along with our expectations as a football team. Yes, I do believe we have all the components in place. And it's just a matter of our, our continued work ethic, continuing to work hard continue to be motivated and enthused about the special program that we have in the beginning stages right now. And I can say it is a very special program. 
with the talent in the Tampa Bay area and the talent um, in Florida, this program could be one of the top programs in the nation by far. We can grow faster, stronger, bigger, quicker than anyone else. Uh, the basic ingredients are there. We have a quality staff in an outstanding community, in a terrific facility, in a hotbed for college football, and based on a university campus that is universally viewed as one of the great up-and-coming universities in America. The first stampede was heard loud and clear in college football circles in 1997, but it's easy to see that the stampede has only just begun, and it appears unwilling to be slowed in the least. From its inception as a dream, the stampede has grown in deafening proportions into a vision and reality. Get used to the sound. Bulldogs!